Well, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, talk about, I've been asked to talk about Korea. Uh, first, uh, first the bad news. Um, I think everybody's aware that the Trump administration has pretty much threatened uh, a preventive war option against North Korea to disarm it of its nuclear weapons. Um, now, I believe, and I'm not going to go into detail about why, but I do believe that very likely, if they decided to launch a preventive war, it would be a nuclear first strike against North Korea. Uh, very briefly, the reason why is a conventional strike will not provide enough assurance to the U.S. that it can keep the war uh, localized to the peninsula. Uh, of course, we've heard people say, well, a nuclear war cannot be localized. Well, uh, I'll just leave the contradiction there, but I think it's very uh, concerning that that's an option that uh, President Trump keeps uh, mentioning. Uh, good news, of course, is, uh, and, and I would say, uh, I, would, I would give uh, some, you know, a combination of, of South Korea and North Korea uh, have kind of moved to preempt that option uh, by uh, beginning a process that I, that I believe is led by uh, South Korean interests to avoid that preventive war. Um, but um, what I want to do now is um, what I'm going to show you in a few moments is informed by the insights of a woman I met in Vladivostok, Russia, who is a analyst of, uh, of, of security in the region and also is considered one of the people in, uh, the, in, in that area who has the best contacts in North Korea. Her name is Anastasia Baranakova. Um, so uh, Anastasia told me, and I'm going to quote her because I think it's very important, many people mistakenly think about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula as only pertaining to nuclear disarmament of North Korea. But what about the inclusion of nuclear weapons in joint exercises by the US and the South Korea and the nuclear umbrella guarantee extended to South Korea by the US ever since the Korean War. A nation that enjoys or suffers from such nuclear umbrella guarantees does not qualify as a non-nuclear state. From this perspective, South Korea has long been nuclear. Um, so what I want to do is, uh, in a little exercise of, of cognitive empathy, uh, we don't have to like North Korea, but uh, this is what Anastasia taught me. Um, here uh, we have North Korea, right? Um, now, this blue area, which extends out into the Pacific, um, that's basically U.S. territory. Um, if, if you know anything about the U.S. Navy, they consider uh, themselves to own the Pacific Ocean. And the U.S. Navy is probably the greatest single military force in the world. Uh, it has access to uh, the nuclear weaponry of the United States, which it shares with, with the Air Force. Um, but, of course, the Air Force has various bases in the region from Okinawa through the Japanese islands, Guam, so forth and so on. Um, and uh, the US has treaties with Japan and South Korea, uh, which ex include explicitly the extension of n nuclear guarantee to those nations. So in effect, South Korea and Japan, from North Korea's perspective, are nuclear nations uh, by the extension of US uh, nuclear weaponry. 
And we also know uh, from the historic facts that have been discovered that Japan, despite supposedly being a non-nuclear nation or a pacifist nation, uh, has made secret agreements and probably still has secret agreements to allow uh, the U.S. to deploy and, and facilitate the deployment of nuclear weapons, as well as to temporarily store them. Um, and uh, many people think South Korea probably has similar uh, such secret agreements. So uh, that's how North Korea views the world looking east. Um, now, to the west is China, a uh, medium scale nuclear power. And then to the north is the second largest nuclear power in the world, Russia. Um, now, many people here, of course, think, well, OK, um, China and Russia are friends of North Korea's. Well, one of the things I learned in traveling through Northeast Asia was, well, not so much. Um, North Korea does not trust China. And uh, the Chinese experts I talked to, uh, to were very frank. They said, right now, North Korea hates China. That was the wor words they used, right? And um, North Korea probably has the best relationship with any major power in the world with Russia. But even that is not uh, terribly close. North Korea distrusts uh, Russia. Uh, the feelings are vice versa. Um, so this little poor nation of North Korea looks at the world surrounded by nuclear powers. Um, so that's just uh, sort of background on how they view the world. When President Trump agreed to uh, the summit meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, he was probably thinking about North Korean disarmament. Now, we know that North Koreans are ready to talk about denuclearization of the entire Korean peninsula. This has very significant implications for South Korea as a hosting nuclear weapons state and, by extension, the alliance with the United States that South Korea has. In order for North Korea to make a non-nuclear peace with the North, the nuclear umbrella must be folded and put away. The U.S. does not necessarily extend nuclear deterrence to any and all U.S. allies, but only on certain occasions, certain conditions. So what was done in the conditions of the 1950s can certainly be undone in new conditions 65 years later. And uh, I think that's going to become an issue very soon. Um, the US will also have to stop sending nuclear-capable aircraft and submarines in the direction of North Korea uh, with uh, clear you know, threat indications involved in it. Uh, there will also have to be an end to any secret agreements that may exist that call for South Korea to provide host permissions and services to U.S. nuclear weapons. All of these changes must happen to meet a minimal level of reassurance and security guarantee for North Korea so that it can feel minimally secure enough to risk nuclear disarmament. I think that's just simply a logical reality. Now, a nuclear-free Korean peninsula is not a new idea. It has been endorsed at various times by North Korea, South Korea, and even by the United States. It has been discussed in official negotiations. No doubt, each of the parties discussing it attributes different meaning to the concept. Um, so it's going to be hard to move forward on it. Um, importantly, I think a professor, Moon Chung-in, of uh, Yonsei University is, is a very senior advisor to President Moon of South Korea and uh, very involved in the upcoming summit uh, planning. 
He wrote an article in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in 2016 where he endorsed the idea of a nuclear weapon-free zone in Korea. Um, so this is a significant area where South Korea is on the verge of moving that's different than U.S. policy. U.S. policy does not currently support a nuclear-free zone in Korea. Um, a week or so ago, Professor Moon was in Japan speaking, and uh, I just want to add this in terms of near-term possibilities of negotiations. He referred to 48 inter-Korean agreements and engagements that presently exist with North Korea. And he said 20 of them are not bound by US sanctions. Uh, so he said, uh, President Moon's vision of creating an inter-Korean economic community is feasible, even under US, UN sanctions regime. Um, so th this indicates to me that South Korea is considering uh, uh, changing or, or, or uh, you know, <clears throat> letting go of sanctions that they have uh, against North Korea in the negotiations. Uh, this uh, will most definitely not be viewed favorably in Washington. You know, and if President Moon agrees to uh, invigorate suspended economic agreements with North, uh, I'm, Washington will view this as a defection from uh, alliance solidarity. And uh, I, have, I would add, I think they're very worried in Washington about this. Um, Washington, Washington uh, and though, you know, probably the majority of policymakers in Washington are invested in South Korea being a particular strong point in the containment of China. And so this is really the context in which they're worried about a rapprochement of South Korea and North Korea. Um, so time's up, I'm told. So anyways, I just want to finish by saying uh, that um, Unless uh, the U.S. is willing to move in the direction of being flexible about alliance arrangements, uh, flexible in the way that both, of, both President Moon and Professor Moon are talking about openly now, uh, there will be severe strain on the alliance, and uh, eventually the alliance may even shatter. Um, so I, I'm going to end my remarks there, and I hope we have some time to discuss it, because I'm sure there's many questions people have. Thank you very much.